let's talk about the hacker method, the book in general. First of all, why did you write the book? Well, um, I had nothing to do. <laughs> we came back from we came back from uh, the field, and you know we'd gotten to a point to where the real estate was performing and paying for the for, for our expenses, and and I was kind of intentionally taking some some time off and and uh, just like following my wife around the house, driving her nuts, and uh, and I said, you know what, I I've never even I mean I have it all over my head, right? Everything that we've done, and and I I had friends of mine. That when we when we moved back from the field, everybody asks, "What are you going to do next?" Nothing, right? I'm just going to like manage the investments. I'm like, what? Like, w- I've never heard any a missionary for sure ever say anything like that. And so I'd had people start kind of like probing. Like, well, how, tell me about that. How did that happen? And then I had one guy say, "Do you think I could do that?" I'm like, of course you could do that. How? And I'm like, oh, well, it's all up here. I don't know. And so that was what gave birth to the idea of maybe I should like figure out what I did and, and articulate it and try to get it in a way that other people would understand it. And maybe it can help some people. So that's what gave birth to that. Very cool. Well, let's go into it. H, okay. you already mentioned that one. Yeah. H stands for hack your lifestyle. Hack your lifestyle. So it's just get looking at all of your different spending categories and trying to figure out a hack for all of them. The house hack, that's the biggest one. Yeah. Eliminate or reduce dramatically your living expenses, your housing expenses through house hacking. And it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be that you have somebody living in your bedroom. Like that's an absolutely great way to do it. You can rent out a bedroom on Airbnb on a nightly rate and you can cover your mortgage if you have a couple extra bedrooms. Right. Uh, But if you don't want that, if you want more privacy, you can buy, I have several homes where I have a house and then a separate building that is on the lot and you could put a fence between them. And so you don't even, you know, nobody would even know. And then you just rent out that other part and it can cover a vast majority of your, of your mortgage. All right. So that's hack your lifestyle. Let's go to the A. Allocation budgeting. So that's the 50, 40, 10 concept. Mm. So get your income or get your expending down to 50% of your income by reducing your expenses, but also increasing your income. Um, and then 40% start investing that in whatever way that you feel comfortable. I know if you haven't been investing, that that might feel intimidating to you. So just start with the basics. Throw it into an S&P 500 mutual fund and just kind of start watching the market and see what happens when the Fed does this and that does that. And Caterpillar has these, you know, just learn the ebb and flow of investing and let that account build up until you can get, and I do recommend people eventually get into real estate. Um, It's the It's the most tried and true asset class for building wealth for thousands of years, right? Uh, Crypto is like three years, you know, (laughs) of existence or or 13 or 30 or whatever it is. Um, But I just encourage people to, yes, get started. Don't wait. Put that 40% in. The earlier you start, the easier it's going to be down the road. You know, if if you can start really early and you have lots of years after your portfolio has built up, it's just so much easier. I talk about financial escape velocity also, like all the the thrust and the fuel that it takes to get up off the ground. But then you get to this point to where you've broken past gravity and you're just literally effortlessly flying at 17,000 miles an hour. It's the same kind of thing happens in building wealth. It, it takes effort and fuel and energy and focus and trial and error and to get up off the ground. But there's a certain point, and I was talking to uh, David Osborne actually told me yeah. this concept, it gets to be a certain point to where the laws of financial gravity no really, no longer really apply to you. You've break, broken past that. And it's not effortless, but it just takes a little bit of fuel to keep that number climbing and climbing and climbing, right? Yeah. And so that it takes that effort in the beginning. You've got to start investing that 40% and then give the 10% away. Um, so that piece of that, I, I talk about... So my experience as running a nonprofit, I had to do a lot of fundraising. And I would meet with... 100 millionaires and 50 millionaires and widows that had nothing and and were living on social security. And I was always blown away by when, you know, I would go in, I'm going to ask this person for money and I'd feel bad about it. And I'd feel like resident or or resistant and sweating. And oh my gosh, I'm going to ask them for money. And they're going to tell me to get out of their house. You know, almost every single time, not only did they not kick me out of their house, they said, thank you. Like what? Thank you for asking you for money. Did you hear me? I, I want you to give me money, right? Um, and and the, the truth is, is, is the people who have figured out how to give away some of what they have earned, I think are the happiest people on earth. And, and when I teach the 50, 40, 10 budget, oftentimes we're focused on the 50%. What can I spend my money on? But when you learn how to give your money away, that can become your favorite category. Like what makes your heart tick? What, what 
injustice like human trafficking? What injustice breaks your heart and you want to fix? And as you get wealthier, you can write bigger and bigger checks and you can have a bigger and bigger impact on the world. And so, so yeah, 50% on your spending, 40% on your investing, which it is a spending account, but just 15 years from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, right? And then that 10% to change the world. All right. H-A. Next, we got C-K. C-K. Cash is king investing. Um, and, and in that chapter or in that section, I'm really trying to expose people who've never really thought of themselves as investors. So it's the unexpected investor's guide to building wealth, right? Mm. Um, you need to make that leap from being a consumer. So, so what I always tell people is when you look at your paycheck, like hopefully you have a physical printout, right? Like look at your paycheck and tell your paycheck you have three purposes. Half of you is to spend for me now, 40% of you is to invest, and 10% is to change the world through your generosity, right? And you're looking at your paycheck, and that 40% investing, you've got to accept the identity or the label of I am an investor, right? Because it is so different from I am a consumer. Like, oh, I got this paycheck. Like, when I got my first job and I got my first paycheck, like, what can I spend all this money on, right? And instead of saying that, saying, how can I invest this money? And begin to take on the identity of looking for opportunities. I always say, you know, somebody might be saying, I'm, I'm waiting for an opportunity to fall on my lap. And I have a kind of a, a comeback to that. Opportunities don't fall in your lap. They pass by your line of vision. Mm -hmm. And if you recognize them and you grab them, you can do something with them. If you don't recognize them, they keep on going, right? They just fly right out of your line of sight and they move on to somebody else that knows what they're looking for and grabs That's it. That's a great point. That's really good. All right, so what is cash is king investing? Why cash is king? What does that mean? Uh, it's it's really just a play on on that concept that the one who has the cash is the one who makes the decisions. Yeah. So when you can save your cash up, you can now go and invest. Exactly it right. You got it. Exactly right. Yeah, and if you if it. you using your cash to make more cash, yep. always be conscious of buying assets that go up in value and pay you cash, right? My advice is always to invest in things that do both of those things, not one or the other. Like you could loan money out to people, that's fine, and that's going to get you some cash, but your, your capital is not growing, right? Um, you could invest in a growth stock, and that's going to go up in value, so it's going up, but it's not paying you a dividend, right? I always encourage people to get both of those sources, and real estate is a fantastic asset class in that sense, that it typically goes up in value. In fact, I want to, I want to say this. When I was doing research, I, I went to the U.S. Census, and they started recording the median household sale price in 1940. Mm -hmm. And then they studied the median sale price every decade after that. There has not been a single decade, great or the Great Depression, 15 recessions, the dot-com bust, the 08 crash. There hasn't been a single 10-year period from 1940 to 50, 67, where real estate hasn't gone up by at least 40% in that decade. Wow. No losses. And not even small gains, forty percent increase or more. Not average and not annual, but over that ten yeah, years, yeah. right? And so we can't guarantee that that's going to be the case going in the future. But the history tells us it's very likely. Yeah. So have a long term view on your investing. Dump your forty percent cash into income producing assets that go up in value, and ride that out to generate more cash. 